Welcome to our webinar today. We've got a topic I think is really good today. And actually, as I think back three or four years ago, I'm not sure how many people will be interested in kind of this remote culture idea, but so many companies have been impacted by this. So I think people are really looking for answers for this. And we've got a really good group of people um, talking about today and also a lot of attendees today. So to get us started, I am Tom Waddleton. I am one of many full-time virtual CFOs at Summit CPA Group. Um, I've been doing this for about five years and I'll be facilitating today's session. So I'm going to go through a few administrative things, introduce our other speakers, and then we'll get into the main topic. So a few housekeeping things. Today is a one CPE credit course and you do need to attend the entire 50 minute session. We will have three polling questions. If you meet those requirements, then you will get a CPE certificate within the next week or so. We also send out the replay slides. So one of the most common questions that we get is how can I get a certificate and do you send out the replay slides? So telling you now you will get those. The best way to interact with us, and there are a few th places where we really would like people to interact with us today is the question function. So I will ask people now, knowing that people are coming in via Zoom, if you can jump into the question function and just tell us where you're from, we'll be interested to kind of see the variety and diversity of people and where they're calling in from. So a chance to get in and use that question function. Okay, I mentioned I work for Summit CPA Group. Let me tell you just a little bit more about our company. So we started as a company 20 years ago and since 2004, we've been offering back office accounting services and CFO services. Back in 2013, we got rid of the office and went to a fully distributed firm. We have tons of flexibility about where people are located, both our employees as well as our, um, I'm sorry, employees and team members, as well as our clients and where they're located. And that has just been huge. And then currently we have joined CP, Anders CPA and Advisors. So we are now a division of that organization. And we are really excited about what that's going to bring. In fact, many of us are going to retreat just in a couple of weeks to talk about sort of what the next step of our company looks like post that merger. Okay, we have two great presenters joining me today. Jody Grunden is partner and found, partner at Anders CPA and Advisors, also the founder, co-founder of Summit CPA Group. Um, Jody and his partner were the ones who made the decision to have us go to a remote company. And I know Jody has talked to me significantly about what the culture looks like. So that is fantastic. And then Josh is our people operations strategist. Josh has been with us now for almost a year. Is that right, Josh? A little over a year. A little over yeah. a year. Um, and helps with all the people operate strategy and really helps reinforce that culture, but then also make sure that it plays through in what we're doing. So Jody, I'll turn it over to you. I would love to hear more the story of how you made the decision for us to become a remote firm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. And for uh, for those of you that follow us a lot, uh, you might have heard the, the story again. So please, uh, please bear with me a little bit. And for those that you haven't, um, you know, it, it was a, it was an interesting uh, story from the very beginning. We started back in 2002 as a traditional brick and mortar accounting firm. So like many of you on the call today, and then in 2004, we made the first switch, you know, cause we wanted to change the way that people thought about accounting. We didn't want to do it the, the normal way. So we wanted to do something a little different. And uh, we made the first switch and we focused on advisory services and uh, forecasting we called it virtual CFO services in 2004. So we've been doing that for a super long time. And uh, with that, initially, it was meeting with clients. They'd come to the office, we'd go out there, and it wasn't truly virtual in nature. It was more meeting with the client on a regular basis and being their, you know, quote unquote CFO. And then it evolved into that virtual aspect as the internet grew. Because um, back then, the internet, if you if, if y'all remember back then, it was really a sketchy hit and mess, you know, web Webinars like this wouldn't have been possible uh, just because, you know, the way that the technology was. And as technology grew, it allowed us to venture outside of Fort in Indiana because that's where we actually were started. And uh, that allowed us to actually work with clients virtually. And so uh, we, for the longest time, from probably 2007 to 2011 ish, uh, we were working with clients virtually like this. And uh, never really meeting the client. You know, we would interview them over a video call like this, and then eventually uh, they'd become a client, and then we'd have all of our meetings virtually. And it didn't happen until 2013 ish. I'd say maybe a little bit, a little bit earlier than that. Uh, we had actually had our true virtual client, meaning that we couldn't by any means go to their office. You know, they were in a completely different state. 
completely different location. And uh, that was that was an aha moment. It was one of those things we picked the client up there in Rhode Island. Again, we were in Indiana. And uh, it, it was it was like, wow, this is this could be something something cool. And, uh, you know, with that, we figured it out, We you know, through trial and error, figured out how to make the experience really great for the client and really great for our team, uh, because our team, again, was located all in one area. And that that concept pretty much grew and, and really grew in strength. Uh, for, it took about, I would say, two or three years. Um, and it just happened that this client was fully remote. So they're one of the top, they were one of the first probably, probably 25 or so fully remote firms uh, ever in the United States and elsewhere. And uh, they had about 50 or 60, you know, 50 or 50 or 60 team members on it. And, and the nice thing about it, I was their CFO and I was able to kind of learn how they did it, what they did right, what they did wrong, you know, all the different ups and downs that they might've had, you know, all the benefits and disadvantages and, and, and really learned a lot from them. And then in 2013, I made the uh, made the ultimate announcement during one of our uh, stand up meetings. You know, we used to have stand up meetings in the office. Everybody stand up, you know, that sort of thing. And and, my, and we always start off with a joke. You know, that's just kind of the the temperament of our company. We start off with a joke to begin with. Well, I kind of forgot about the joke because it was so impressing. I really wanted to talk about it. It's been building up. And I said, you know, hey guys, everyone, we're going to go remote. And 2013, you can imagine the response I got. It was like everybody's waiting for the punchline because they thought it was a joke. And uh, then once they realized it wasn't, you know, they uh, they started uh, giving me all the reasons why remote wouldn't work. You know, oh, we we need to be collaborative. Uh, we the, the you know the clients want us to shake their hands. They want us to be in front of them. You know, all the different things that you know you folks are or a lot of you experienced during the pandemic. You know, I we experienced back in 2013 all the excuses. And, uh, you know, with that, it, it came down to the fact that, you know, the team said, you know, it was a rebellion. Even my partner, you know, uh, who's an extreme advocate now of uh, going fully remote, he was anti fully remote thing. He's like, there's no way. He goes, I got kids. I have five kids or four kids or 10 kids. It didn't make any difference at the time. I got kids. <laughs> and uh, with that, they're coming in now. How am I going to do it? And, uh, you know, and and he, he just wasn't, he wasn't up for it. And so, I had to, at the time, we had about 18 folks on the team. And at the time I'm like, well, you know, we've got to make a decision. Either we go remote and lose most of my team because they, you know, they're, they'll head for the high road there, or um, we do brick and mortar. And so I, I caved in and decided to go ahead and rebuild and re, redo the office. Okay. We're going to go brick and mortar. I get it. You guys don't want to do it. And so we did the, we, we did the brick and mortar thing. And, and I, I spent about a hundred thousand dollars refurbishing the entire office. We put really cool, uh, TVs and all the offices. We widened the office. I own the building, so I could do all this stuff. We, the cubes are really small initially. Made them bigger. You know, made you know, put offices where we didn't have them before. Put TVs in the conference rooms. It was really state of the art type stuff, and and we're pretty excited about it. You know, again, spent about a hundred thousand dollars back then, and uh, it was kind of funny. It took about six weeks, six to eight weeks for the construction to happen. You know, it was supposed to be four weeks, and it just kind of dragged on and on. Mm -hmm. and, and after time, it was like one of those things. It was kind of funny, Tom, because it, it just people just one by one came in and said, you know what? I kind of like this remote thing. You know, I figured out, you know, why, you know, my excuse, you know, maybe I didn't have internet. I upgraded my internet package or this is kind of neat. I don't have to, you know, wear a suit every day or, you know, yeah. all, all the different things that people said, you know, you know, clients are loving this site, you know, thing. I can, I can really work with people. No problem. And, and, and Jody, was, I'm not sure you made it clear. You did completely close the office during this time, right? So people were forced to work remotely during that time. hundred yes. percent. Yeah. 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 I, Cause I kicked them all out because yeah. the construction was it's so construction. Loud. Yep. Cause they tore walls down and everything. Yeah. So there was yeah. no way they could work there. And when they were home, yeah, they, they figured out how to, how to do it, you know, yeah. similar again to the pandemic. And uh, with that, I'm like, wow, I got a really good opportunity to do one of two things, either bring everybody back in afterwards or mm -hmm. allow them to actually uh, try this remote thing out. And uh, with that, they tried it out. They loved it. Uh, kept the office for about a year. We had only about three or four people actually come back into the office. Mm -hmm. And so I kept the office about, you know, for, for a year I owned it. And before I started rent or leasing it out, uh, just as a safety net type of thing. And it, it just kind of spread throughout. I, I just, I made that really big time effort saying, you know what, I'm going to force this issue and, and hire abroad. I'm not going to hire any more in Fort Wayne unless it's a perfect candidate. I'm going to hire all across the United States. And we we started doing that. We started picking up clients, or not clients, but we started picking up employees left and right all yep. throughout looking for this remote thing. 
And what happened was it, it was it was hard initially. It was hard to find remote. How do you find remote people when you're living in Indiana and in Fort Wayne, Indiana? And uh, you know, with that, I was kind of fortunate because Forbes uh, interviewed me um, for an article in back. I think it was 2014, 2015. And uh, there, because we were named one of the one of the first 125 firms ever, you know, go remote. We were actually the they, they said we we're the first financial firm. And with that, mm. um, w- once that article went out and listed us as a top 100 firm uh, nationally, um, the internet just blew up. It was like it was one of those things. I I was in a meeting with a, with a um, CFO. And I was a CFO. I was in a meeting with a, an accountant. We always pair up. And my 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 bottom of my screen kept like going off and on. It was like every two seconds I was getting another resume pop up. I thought someone was spamming me. It was like, oh my gosh, what's <laughs> going on? Calling calling my marketing person, say, hey, what's going on here? And they're like, no, these are all all legit. And I got about two thousand resumes within about a day and a half. It wow. was a ton. Yeah, wow. it was it was amazing. And so then it was like, now what do we do with all these resumes? I can't open them all. And uh, so we had to kind of figure processes around that, but that really helped us and spark, you know, spark the uh, the remote environment. And we went from, you know, 18 folks. It, you know, and by the way, I built the building so that we could house 30 because I thought, well, in 10 years, we'll build, we'll might fill 30, you know, 30. Within like two years, we already had 30 folks on the team and it just kept blowing up. And, and we, we just kept hiring and hiring and hiring all throughout the United States and, and which kind of develops into the, this talk today. It's like, you just can't hire and, and hope that your culture is going to be the same. Cause we had a really cool culture uh, when we were brick and mortar. It was outstanding. We did really cool things. We did fun stuff. We call us the non-traditional approach. We didn't wear suits and ties like everyone else. We had, you know, back then it was kind of like the requirement. We, we, we've we never experienced that, but we even went further than that through the remote because, you know, the big thing I thought with the remote background or the remote thing is how can I keep this culture there? Cause I don't want to lose it. It's so, so important to us. And uh, so that's why this topic, like I mentioned today, is going to be uh, super important, you know, from the you know, kind of going through that whole thing. Because back, I would say about five years ago, uh, maybe six, we really took a dedicated amount of money and we said, you know, hey, we're going to really focus on culture. You know, we're going to spend money on something that really no other accounting firm that I was even aware of did. And, and that was bringing on a, a people ops person and not not an HR person, not doing benefits and that sort of thing but a people ops person where that person can provide strategy to our team. And, and what, what, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that, you know, Hey, I'm not figuring out this remote thing pop into, and, and that was Zach um, Montre and, and Zach still mm-hmm. with us and still a great member of the team, probably one of our A plus hires. If you think of an A plus hire, just don't tell him that for sure. But with, with that, uh, he really kind of helped the director team, the CFOs and the accounting team at that time really relate to each other, you know, and, you know, he brought different methods on, he, he was always available. And I, and I always, he always, that show billions, uh, I always refer to Zach as our Wendy, you know, Wendy, mm-hmm. the, the person that the owner could come down and sit down and, t- and talk to kind of more of a business coach or a therapy coach, but just really kind of helping out in all different ways in the mental aspect of not only working remote, but working with people, working in a, an environment, a CPA type environment. And, and with that, as we grew and grew and grew, you know, Zach could only do so much. And so that's when we thought, you know what, we need to make another, an, an additional investment. And that's about a year and a half ago, we reached out and we found Josh and uh, Josh will be leading this discussion today and talking a lot today, but uh, he was the, he, he was the, 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 basically the, the thing, the piece of puzzle that we we're missing there. And, and he was allowed or we, we actually uh, gave him the opportunity to work with our accounting team. And so that was the uh, the nice thing about that. So we've got two people ops person, uh, people ops strategists that work with our team. And, and like I said, they they do everything from the, you know, help with the hiring process through the review process, you know, through the coaching process throughout the, the whole thing. And, and when I say coaching, um, let's make sure we, we're very clear what that actually means. You know, a lot of firms say, yeah, we coach our team and stuff like that. And that's kind of the progression. I don't mean reviewing people's work. I don't mean I don't mean you know making sure that everything balances. They did a good job at work. I mean on the soft side of it, are they enjoying work? Do they like to work? You know, you know, do they like who they're working with? How can we improve a relationship when one might you know when a couple of folks might butt heads with each other? You know, what what does what what does you know what are different people's styles? 
uh, of speaking. You know, you know, if you look at the disc, are you a D I S C? You know, where where are you at in there? How do you communicate with that type of thing? And really push those forward. And, and that's why Josh has been such an integral part of our team uh, from the from as soon as he came on to to now. And you know, heck, we might have to we might have to hire another Josh here pretty soon. Unfortunately, uh, there's only one Josh, and and we're hoping that Josh can help find that third Josh to add the team as we grow. Because we've grown from, like I said, 18 folks when we first started uh, the remote business to about 55-ish uh, team members and another 15 contractors, you know, you know, all, all across the uh, the world there, uh, making it a team of about 70. And so uh, it's really grown, and we've uh, doubled our size every three years in revenue. And profit margins, saying about a 25% margin. So we really try to grow things and really kind of help the culture uh, and, and really bring on really great people uh, to, to learn. So, Josh, I'm going to let you take it uh, from here and, and, and kind of go through, you know, what, you know, kind of, if you can, show, show us the benchmarking that we've been put against just recently to kind of go through that a little bit and, and just, you know, kind of open it up so that everybody can have it. Now, now what I would like to do is the, the chat button's there for a purpose. And we want to make sure that you mm-hmm. learn as much as you can from us. We're a completely open book. There is no question that's off limits. So feel free to use that chat as much as possible as you can. And, and that way that we can make sure that we, you know, bring any kind of question or answer any kind of question that you might have throughout. Yeah. And we already learned a lot about our audience. We've got all the states and I saw Ottawa on there, but lots of Texas, California, Virginia, kind of people from everywhere, which is really good. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for the introduction, Jody. I really appreciate it. Um, Like Tom introduced me before, my name is Josh Jeans. Tom, I wanted to note too, I noticed that you're wearing the same shirt today that you were in that picture on the slide. (laughs) So um, it's a great shirt. As you guys know, I have one shirt I wear it every single day. And so this is what you get. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I, I have love getting to be a part of the team for the last about a year and a half now i my academic background was in organizational strategy so i'm not an accountant and i will readily admit that Um, but i love getting to work with our team and getting to really help our team learn about themselves and how they can stretch themselves personally professionally how they can operate better on a team they can delegate and review work with team members well they can manage up they can manage across with clients Uh, i've loved getting to play that role really focused in on that senior accountant level across our team Uh, zach helps work with more of our senior staff on the team and i'm more in that mid-level range Um, and i'm excited to walk through some of what we've learned and uh, like jody said we really want to be an open book to share what we have we don't want to withhold anything that's been working for us Uh, and as we've sought to learn that from other firms even like jody said with some of those early clients what are you guys doing well what's not going well how do we continue to iterate on that and get better and better as we go so i want to introduce you guys really quickly to uh I'll just mention a tool that's called Amplify, and that's a. It's hey, Josh, a, Josh, as you get into that, uh, if you could, throughout the webinar, we we merged with a top 100 accounting firm in April, and uh, we are now their division or mark, you know, the, their virtual CFO division, and, and, and kept our company intact throughout the thing to really kind of blow up the virtual CFO market in the in the area there, and so our goal is to go from. $10 million to $50 million over the next five years in revenue. And this is going to be super, super important. So as you're going through, if you don't mind linking, hey, what, what we did when we are fully remote, you know, back all the way through April and now kind of a hybrid type of thing, you know, going through that would, I think that would help everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So this, these results here are going to be, uh, specific to our fully remote crew, but I can bring in kind of some of the hybrid elements there. So Amplify is an awesome resource. They do, they help facilitate engagement surveys with uh, your team. They do it for thousands of companies across the U.S. Uh, we really wanted to bring this up for you guys so you knew that we weren't just blowing smoke when it came to <laughs> developing a healthy culture here. Uh, so these are our scores. So we do this quarterly. So this was our most recent scoring metric that came out in July. Uh, so all of our engagement scores are collected anonymously. Uh, like I said, they're reported quarterly. They're all um, plotted on a bell curve. So 75 is a median engagement Uh, score. And we, you can see there on their ticker, we were at an 81.91. So that put uh, our virtual CFO team in the top 15% of any service-based firm, period. So that's not... uh, 
specific to accounting firms or financial services, but that's any firm that identifies as predominantly service-based. So people focused, and I really want to take note of that for an accounting firm to be in the top 15% mm-hmm. of all service-based firms. Uh, we got some really positive feedback from the team there at Implify that these are pretty unheard of results that they're seeing. And there's something, there's some secret sauce going on. Uh, I want to make note too that they're benchmark for uh, participation there is 70%. You can kind of see on the Mm. bottom part of that graphic, we had 89% of the virtual CFO team respond to that. So there's a really high response rate to make sure we're getting a fair assessment of what engagement is across the team. Really want to show this to you guys. One, I want to plug that uh, getting engagement scores for your team can be really helpful because even with these healthy scores, we got some really great drivers out of that those results that helped us implement change to better engage with our team, to better help people uh, find fulfillment in the work that they're doing. And maybe for some people, it was career pathing and giving them a, a clear idea of what's next for them. Uh, but we got some great drivers out of that. So Amplify is awesome. I'm I'm not sponsored by Amplify or anything like that, but I would encourage you to, this is a great way to invest in your people is uh, getting some real solid metrics on what their engagement looks like. So. Josh, as I go on to the next one, I'll go ahead and launch the first polling question. And so we'll learn a little bit more. So people are gonna see that pop up now. Okay, now I'll go ahead and go on. Perfect. So this is kind of our, roadmap for where we're headed today. And I wanted to make note that these are not stock images. Our people really do smile and enjoy each other. Uh, Those are some of our teammates at our uh, most recent in-person retreat in Nashville, Tennessee, which was great for me. It was 20 minutes down the road. I didn't even have to uh, travel for it very far. Uh, But where we're going today is we're going to talk about three uh, pillars of building a healthy remote culture. The first of which is building trust across your team. The second of which is going to be supporting diverse motivations and motivators for the people on your team. And the third is we want to make sure we're telling the right stories. And I know that could bring up a big question mark for you, and we're going to get there and flesh out what that means. But these are three pillars that I think you can build a a really beautiful, strong remote culture on top of those. And Mm -hmm. it's important that they go in that order too. And we'll walk through that as we move forward. So as we get into building trust here. um, So let me just tell you very quickly, uh, we're ready to close the poll, but I'll tell you who we have. Um, 25% of the people said they have few or no remote team members. 57% 57% okay. said a significant number, and then 19% said they have a fully remote work team. So it sounds like a lot of people in that kind of hybrid, a significant number, both office mm-hmm. and remote workers that we have. Gotcha. Okay. okay. That's helpful to know. We almost have a bell curve there, too, where we've got we a, the majority of our uh, folks with us today are in a hybrid uh, environment. Mm-hmm. Well, I think this is going to be true no matter where your people are. Even if you're in a fully in-office environment, um, this is going to be true that building trust has to be foundational to everything else that you do. And the first point I want to bring up here is, do I have all the information that I need? Now, what's important to know here is your team is going to get discouraged if they ever feel like information is being gatekept from them. If they feel like they're only getting a small piece of information, what I wanna make sure we're doing as leaders is we're letting people see a big enough picture so that they can get excited about what they're doing. And I think it can be a temptation to, in order to hold on to or maintain control, to only give people insight into exactly what they need, And sometimes I think it can be done with really strong intentions of not letting people get distracted or kind of off base, but Mm -hmm. to stay on task. But the reality is your your healthy team members who are really contributing to the team and to the mission that you're on together, they really want to see a bigger picture of what's going on. And they want to know how their piece of the puzzle fits into that. So our folks can be really limited when they don't have all the information available to them. And we want to make sure the first step of building trust across the team is that we're not gatekeeping information from anybody on our team. 
And part of that comes with a sense of openness with your team. So your team and your peers have to know uh, they can come to you. They can seek information. If something's not been made readily available to them, they can ask and they won't get a slap on the wrist or, you know, a snarky comment, but you would instead kind of pull back the curtain from them and let them see a broader picture of what it is that's actually going on. Um, Because people feel empowered when they actually have access to all the information that they need. And then they're able to freely do the work that they need to do instead of doing a little bit, stopping, realizing I don't have what I need. Now I've got to go ask somebody. Well, they weren't the right person. I have to ask somebody else. Uh, Instead, we really want to democratize access to information as much as possible so people can efficiently move forward with their tasks and also that they stay um, engaged with the larger mission of the group. Yeah, Josh, one of the things that comes to my mind as you're describing that is how much more I think you need to be intentional if you're in a remote environment. I think it's easy in an office environment to know that a lot of water cooler talk or just chatter in meetings and things happens and information kind of gets out or things are on the walls and things like that. And in a remote environment, I think you have to be much more disciplined about here's where you get key information that goes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I also think it has a lot to do with, you know, kind of with the intentionality, the way that the meetings are designed. I think meetings are Mm. super important in a remote environment. Um, We have, you know, a meeting every every Monday that uh, the team gets together and it's really, I mean, it it really, there's really not a whole lot of substance to it. If you look at, uh, you know, if you're looking for that type of thing, we're, we're talking about starting out with a joke. We go to a fun fact, you know, we have a different person tell it each each week. And it's, it, it's, it's kind of exciting. You know, they get a chance to say something, you know, you know, in front of 50 or so people. And then they'll, then we have another person coming with a topic of discussion and it could be, you know, why does Tom wear blue shirts all the time? Or, you know, it could be whatever. And uh, you know, this that, week, this week was, is there a strange phobia that you have? Right. And a lot of people told funny stories about things that really yeah. scare them. And it's that kind of topic. We learn about each other through that. Yeah, and I, I think that really kind of helps the, the 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 morale helps you know people to kind of let their you know let their sleeves down a little bit and and really kind of find out about people you know had we never done that I probably wouldn't know that you know our our director of accounting Jamie's kids are huge in basketball they love playing basketball he coaches yeah. basketball you know stuff like that come up all the time and and it really helps out but I, I think having those you know that type of a meeting we spend only half an hour so we half an hour of the week is spent you know, with that, in addition to some of the strategic meetings that we have with our team. But I think those type of things are super important in developing this culture. But then even bring it out even further. Um, a lot of people ask, well, how do you, you know, what, what do you, you know, you guys never get together. How do you guys know each other? It's like, well, that's not mm-hmm. true. You know, we're fully remote, fully, you know, we're, we're virtual, 100%. We have, we're spread pretty equally throughout the United States. Um, but we do meet together twice a year uh, for team retreats. And, We've made a huge investment, you know, in, in these retreats to make sure that, you know, we get a chance to hang out with each other, you know, get a chance to go out and grab a beer or coffee, you know, whatever that might be, you know, find out a little bit more in depth about people. Because when you're in a, in a remote environment, no matter how much you think, you know, how big your company is, it makes no difference. You could be a thousand person or a 10 person shop. You only really work with those few folks. Maybe it's five or 10 people that you're working mm-hmm. with on a daily basis. And that's it. And you're not seeing anybody else. And so what you have to do is you have to make that small amount of people get bigger, you know, and you do it through these team meetings where they get a chance to do the one offs type of thing. But where we found the most, the most, uh, you know, bang for a buck is having those um, offsite conferences where we have our team retreats. And we do that twice a year in which we'll take our team and entire team, not just the partners, the managers, the entire team uh, goes with us to, you know, we did Tennessee and Nashville, like Josh had mentioned, where we'll spend three days, have some really good topics, mostly soft skill topics, and, and really kind of mentioning and talking about, you know, how we can, you know, better ourselves as a, as a team. And and and, the, and it's kind of funny because, you know, most team retreats, people can't wait until it's over and then they, then they book out. Um, with these, they can't wait till it's over and then they hang out with each other the rest of the time. And, and a lot of times they'll go out and they'll hang out with each other till, you know, real late in the, in the evening. Uh, just to, you know, because they don't get that opportunity. And the, the very reason that we actually start our team retreats at 10 o'clock and not eight o'clock is so that 
they can do, you know, the fun stuff like that. Because again, the purpose of their treats not to educate, you can educate throughout the year remotely. The purpose of the tree is get that bonding experience mm-hmm. and really get a chance to know it. Because after that retreat, their little bubble of 10 people now is now maybe 20. And so now they're asking somebody they've never had an opportunity to even talk with that they may pop into their office, like in Sokoko. Someone mentioned that we're in Sokoko. We've been in Sokoko since 2000, probably 15 ish. And they get a knock on their door, hang out with them a little bit, ask them personal questions, all that kind of stuff, or even ask them business questions if they had. So again, it, it really develops that team team retreat, that, that trust that we're talking about there. They, they get a chance to open up, get a chance to meet each other, get a chance to be vulnerable. And, and that, that's super important. As Tom mentioned, on being deliberate. You have to be deliberate as an owner of a firm to make sure that, that type of stuff happens um, mm-hmm. because you can't hire everybody like yourself, right? I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm definitely, a, I would say, an extroverted person, entrepreneur person. I can't hire just entrepreneurs. I've got to hire a variety of people and get those variety of people to actually bond together. And that's the important part of this trust is building that trust. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really like something that you guys are sharing there that I, I hear as a through line is there has to be a really high level of intentionality to make sure mm-hmm. that people do have what they need, both that they have the connections they need with their teammates, that they have access to the information that they need. Because like you said, Tom, it's when you're in a fully remote environment, or even for that really big chunk of our crowd today, who's got a team that's mixed and some are remote and some are in office. Yeah. You don't have the casual catching of information like you do yes. in an in office environment. So it takes as a leader, it takes that one extra step of intentionality to think who should be in the room, who really needs to have this information, because it's not going to trickle out throughout the office for the rest of the day, like it might if we were gathered in one physical space. So mm-hmm. I need to make sure the people who need this information or might need this information have access to it and they get access to it as soon as possible. I agree. You know, we've got a couple questions that came in because of this conversation. So let me start and try and answer one. One asked about the structure of the team retreats and do we do things like icebreakers and things like that. Um, what I would say is there's two things that we do to really help people interact. And you will find if people interact in a remote environment, it, you connect very quickly. Like when I met Josh for the first time in person, I had already talked to him several times. But we do things like cocktail parties and dinners where we will plan to ha- make sure that people intermix. So maybe dinners of eight people, but we'll say, hey, here's your assignment. And we'll make sure that we have people move around so that you don't just end up with the same people who know each other comfortably going together. The other thing I know that we do is like in different topics, like personal development, like Jody mentioned, the DISC profile. We've had topics around that. And one of the exercises we've done is have people put themselves in their own groups. You can see the people who are the Ds in one corner of the room and the people that are the Is in the other. And we talk about what that kind of, what the behaviors are of those people and things like that. And you see people that are similar. So it's an interactive kind of get people together. We don't tend to do sort of just icebreaker um, kind of things, but I think those are great ways to get people involved. Yeah, because yeah. keep in mind, like Tom had mentioned, we're, we're already on video all the time. So we're seeing people's eye contact. We're seeing their facial expressions. I know Tom pretty well. The only thing I don't know about Tom, the first time I meet him is how tall Tom is. Such and uh, that's thing. really the big, the big difference, right? Yes. Outside of that, you know, we've already hung out with each other, you know, for a long time. And so that's, yeah. that's where the icebreaker isn't as important um, as you might think it would be. Yeah. That's true. Okay. At my at my first retreat, I did happen to meet the tallest and shortest person on our team at the same time. And I had only ever <laughs> seen them on Zoom. So I did not know what to anticipate. And it made it all the more dramatic that they walked up to me next to each other, probably at least two feet of height difference between them. So <laughs> that, uh, that's funny. Yeah, I, I think kind of going along with that same sort of intentionality that we were bringing up here, a huge question to ask when it comes to building trust is, would your team members say that they're micromanaged or are they trusted to actually do their job? And as leaders, I know that this can be a real challenge to set down some of the control that you are accustomed to having over the work that's being done or the sequence in which work, work is being done and really trust your team to pick it up and run with it. But the reality is, as as leaders, we have to be aware that our team is probably more sensitive to this than we really think that they are. So if 
if I'm working and I feel like big brother Jody is, you know, lurking over my shoulder every day or every couple hours asking, what's the status of this item? Have you done it? Have you completed it? Did you do it this way? It's really going to start to take my ownership of the task away from me and any sort of creativity that I could bring to it or excitement to it is going to get sapped away as I'm over managed on what I'm doing. So really in a healthy environment, we want to build trust that we've hired good people and we've trained them to be able to know what to do. And I think the real key here is that we have an environment that is trusting and safe. So if they don't know what to do, they will come ask. But we really try to push ownership of understanding onto the team members. So we want to make sure that you've received adequate training, that you have all the support and resources that you need. But I'm going to assume that you're highly competent, highly capable, and that you can do this. And I may, out of care for you and kind of care for the team, I may occasionally check in and see, you know, are you resourced in the way that you need? Do you have access to everything that you need to get this done? Is there anything I can do to make your life easier as you're, you know, moving the ball down the field here? But that's really different from demanding a status report every 90 minutes on what's happening, uh, because that really shows your team, like, I don't actually trust you to do this job. And I trust me to manage it, but now I'm just using you to get it done instead of giving trust and ownership to your team to say, actually, I, I think I hire smart people who are capable, who want to see success on this team. And I want you to trust me that if you come to me because you don't understand something, I'm not going to snap at you. I'm just going to make sure you do understand it and that you have access to the resources that you need. And I may not even be the best person to answer this question. You could come to me and say, I don't know what to do next. And I could put my hands up and be like, man, I don't either. But let's go ask this other person on the team who's done mm -hmm. it before, who's been successful. We could really lean on her because I know she's crushed this in the past. So this is something I think I want to be gentle here because I know this can be a hard uh introspective topic to sit with is, do I really trust my team to be autonomous and to own their tasks? Or am I kind of hunching over their shoulder and thus taking away their ownership and their creativity and their autonomy? Um, and then honestly, you're creating a sense of learned helplessness there because as you micromanage, then you're going to have to continue doing that forever because you're taking away their ownership of task. They're not going to want to take initiative. They're not going to want to iterate on something to make it better uh, because they're, instead of focused on the success, instead of focusing on the success of what they're doing, they're focusing on avoiding the consequences of your micromanagement. And we want to make sure to move away from that at all costs. Yeah. yeah Bar Barbara brought up a great, great question. You know, how to get people, how to get your managers away from, you know, having to see people physically. Um, you know, we've, you know, I, I'm trying to, I was trying to you know, reflect on that. And, and the biggest thing that we do is we don't bill hourly and, and we don't um, manage people's time in that manner. So our, ours, again, like Josh had mentioned is very task driven. So, what that means is that, you know, Tom might have a meeting on Wednesday with, with a client at three o'clock and he expects his senior advisor accountant to have that financial statement, the forecast, everything mm -hmm. dialed in two days prior to that so that they can then meet, go over it and, and then uh, be prepared for that meeting there. And, and so it's more task driven there. And so, so basically what Tom's managing is really not the hours they're working in there. He's managing on getting that information to them at the time that he needs it. And so I think that's the the, the biggest difference I, I'm guessing from what uh, a normal mm -hmm. CPA firm would would experience. Because again, we're not time driven, and we track time. We track time only to see where where we need to fit. You know, figure. You know, maybe for educational purposes that sort of thing. But we don't bill by the hour, uh, which is uh, which is very important. Uh, Tom, if you could add to that a little bit, I, I think I think it's coming from your perspective would be really important. Yes, I think it's a great question. And if you think of micromanaging the kind of, I have to see someone, I have to be able to see Jody to know that Jody's working hard. Um, I, I think you answered it very well, um, Jody. The fact that people are in front of clients and we do measure client satisfaction and then there's work deliverables. 
those things of, you know, each week you're going to be meeting with a client. Many of my seniors are meeting with the client without me. So I'm going to hear if that doesn't go well, or if they're skipping meetings or things like that, and then they're providing deliverables. And we know about what workload people should be able to handle in doing that work. And so if they're able to get their work done, I guess you could say on extreme, if they can do it in 20 hours a week and clients are happy and they have a full book, good for them. Teach us how to do the same kind of thing to mm -hmm. do that. But I think it does get you away from, I don't need to know when they're working and doing that. I need them to get the work done. Sometimes you do have to look really closely. Like, can I measure what they're coming out with and what I know if it's good quality and things like that? Um, yeah. but yes, I agree with you completely. Yeah, and I think Barbara has a little um, like psychic sense because that leads perfectly into our next point here. Mm -hmm. um, another really important piece of this is building in those rhythms that are going to help support your team. So you really want to ask yourself, uh, am I going to be surprised by feedback or will constructive feedback be normalized in my experience? And what, what I mean by that there is we set up rhythms in our team uh, both from a people operations standpoint of, I, I have a formal standing check-in with our senior accountants every three weeks. We've decided that that makes the most sense uh, because if I were to meet with our accountants monthly, uh, our senior accountants have a monthly rhythm. So in the first week of the month and the third week of the month, they could feel really differently about life and about their time <laughs> management and about their team. So I want to make sure that I'm checking in with them at various times during that monthly rhythm. So we set three weeks and that's how it works in my relationship. Uh, but we set up rhythms and patterns of coaching with our team. So instead of the kind of proverbial, oh, I need to see what they're doing. I need to check in with them. Mm -hmm. It's nice both for your team to know, okay, I've had this question come up. It's not urgent. And I know I'm meeting with my coach in two days. I'm going to put it on a sticky note. And I'm just going to bring it up during that coaching call. We also have trainers on our team who do regular meetings um, with the team that they're responsible for. And the leadership across our team has the freedom. You know, Tom gets to decide for himself with the senior accountants he's working with, what's the best cadence for me to check in with mm -hmm. them, to meet with them. And some of those meetings are going to be standing client prep meetings. Um, but some of those meetings are just going to be check-ins. How, how are you doing in the whole scope of your work? Where do you feel like you need to grow in your competency in XYZ? How can I provide some of this feedback to you? Um, but a lot of that comes back to putting systems and rhythms in place so that our team members are getting feedback regularly. Something mm -hmm. I want to take note of here is a real downfall for a lot of firms and unfortunately, a lot of you have probably experienced this before. I know that I have. Uh, you get into an annual review and you find out that you did something wrong seven months ago and you had no clue that that happened. And let me be clear, that's not happened to me here um, in a previous role, but that's a that's a real recipe for a toxic environment because then you create this sense of people walk around and they don't know where they stand with their team. They don't know where they stand with their leaders. And, you know, that's where you get into a situation where somebody's going into an annual review and they're sobbing or having, you know, anxiety or panic attacks because they have no clue what's coming. Well, I help facilitate our annual reviews on our team. And I still don't think to this day I've ever been in an annual review where somebody was surprised by what mm -hmm. was said. Good. And it's a formal time for us to stop and check in together. But the feedback that they're getting are things that they've heard from their peers and from their leaders consistently. I think this goes back to a core value of ours is being candid. And we have to be able to communicate with one another um, without kind of letting the sun go down on your anger. Um, that, hey, I, I really didn't like the way this went. Let's meet up and talk about how we can uh, shift this for the next time we get in front of that client because this was pretty messy. And I know you didn't want it to go that way. I don't want it to go that way again. Let's check in on this next week. Um, but it's really important to make sure our team is never surprised by constructive feedback, but that that's a normal part of their rhythm. Mm -hmm. Josh, I, I was, I've been taught how to give feedback several times. And one of the things that I was actually taught was you give a, if you're going to give someone constructive feedback, make sure you give a positive, like before and after to sort of soften and make it come across better. <laughs> I've heard you yeah. give some thoughts on that before. And I love that you're smiling because it looks like maybe you don't totally agree with that. 
Yeah, I um, I will use the word that my like delightful Southern mom likes to replace it with. Uh, nobody wants to eat a schnick sandwich, right? <laughs> uh, so, and I think there's great intentions there with leading with a compliment. You know, Jody, I love your Hawaiian shirt. You looked like an idiot yesterday in front of a client, <laughs> but I thought you were really funny at the end of the meeting. Like none of none of that positive really matters for you. Um, they're just going to be consumed with the constructive or with the negative. And I think um, throwing in some compliments can kind of cheapen that feedback and mm -hmm. it can take the, the integrity and the intention out of it. So we want to make sure that we're really moving towards our team thoughtfully and with care as we give that constructive feedback. Yeah. So I launched a poll question and what we have, we asked about how kind of feedback and we have only 2% that have exclusively constructive and only 4% that have exclusively positive. And then we have about a third that are mostly constructive, some positive, and then 60% are mostly positive and some mm -hmm. constructive. So kind of the bell, bell curve that yeah. to me, that looks fairly healthy mm -hmm. um, if that's what's really happening. You know, I, I would say that positive feedback by itself is probably not the greatest thing. So um, in meaning right. that you can tell people how great they're doing all the time, but if they're not learning from their mistakes or not learning from issues that might be developing, that could actually be a negative. And so it's super important when giving feedback, you always, you know, you, you always give feedback that's constructive in a way. It's not beat up people. That's not what we mean by that, but it's, you know, hey, I noticed that your camera, you know, isn't on all the time. We need your camera on all the time. You know, that's just how we do it. You need your camera on when you're meeting clients, when you're meeting people. That's just a requirement. You know, that that type of thing might dwell on somebody and really get to them. Hey, why hasn't Tom turned his camera on? Why hasn't Tom turned his camera on? Why? And it's like, well, no one's told Tom to turn his camera on. Right. You know, that's right. that's important. You know, those type of things are super important to make sure that you're constantly giving that feedback because again, it's not fair to the person. Uh, if they don't know what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. So be careful on just giving positive feedback only. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love, we've been having a really great conversation and I love some of the engagement we're getting. I want to make sure uh, we get to move forward to cover our content yeah. today. I know sure. we're coming up on time. So we're, we're going to kind of move to that second pillar now, uh, supporting diverse motivations. And I, I know that was probably one that made you wrinkle your forehead a little bit uh, there at the beginning, but I want to give some more flesh and color to that. Yeah, as leaders, we've got to embrace the reality that our teams are made up of complex people with diverse motivations. I love that Jody shared earlier, uh, you know, kind of some self-awareness there of, I'm an extrovert, I'm a very entrepreneurial person, but it would not be wise for me to just recruit people and add people to the team who are exactly the same as me. Um, it's important to know that we actually do miss out on some real tangible elements like productivity, retention, and job satisfaction, if we're not taking this into account, if we're not actually engaging with the reality that the different people on our team are motivated in different ways, they're looking for a different end result in their career, in their daily life, and we want to make sure to build an environment that's inclusive of that. So mm -hmm. an illustration that, oh, sorry, somebody going to share? Nope, nope, you're good. An illustration that I really like from uh, Kim Scott's Radical Candor, she talks about uh, the difference between rock stars and superstars. And she basically goes through how um, we need both of these characters on our team. A rock star, think of that person as somebody who's solid as a rock. They're really content in what they're doing. They're getting better and better at what they're doing, but they don't need to move to the next rung on the ladder immediately. They don't have this kind of burning, itching to get to the next biggest and brightest thing. They're going to be steady. They're going to be consistent. They're going to give your team, um, yeah, a real sense of stability. Then we have superstars who are people who are just blazing ahead all the time. They're driven. They're entrepreneurial. They want to know what's, what's the next thing I can get to. What's the next achievement I can, um, move through or the next notch I can add to my belt. They're going to be huge in innovating on your team. They're going to drive other people on your team to be um, kind of the best version of themselves. And I want to be careful that we don't think like, oh, I just want to fill my team with superstars. The reality is it's not good, bad, or um, 
there's no qualifier to this, but superstars are going to be more likely to move on from your organization because they're always thinking and dreaming about what's the next thing? What's the greatest thing? How could I move forward? How can I develop? And the reality is retention is significantly lower for people with that sort of personality and working style. And that's not a bad thing at all. We just have to be aware that if you kind of put all your eggs in one basket, you're going to end up with a result that is not what you were looking for. But we really want to bring a balance across those motivations of understanding that some people are going to be really content with what they do. They're going to like the team that they're on and the work that they're doing. And, you know, I can think of several people on our team who are senior accountants who absolutely love being a senior accountant. The idea of becoming a CFO one day would make their eyes roll to the back of their head. They never (laughs) want to do it. And we have other people on our team who are early in their career um, in a similar role at that senior accountant, for example, who are so driven, they're so hungry, they're taking on a bigger and bigger book of business, they want to shadow CFOs, they want to learn what's next. And we have space and place for both of those. We want to make sure we're feeding the motivations of both of those different types of team members. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the other person that you're not mentioning, Jack, Josh, is the no star. And as Kim Scott mentioned, you want to get the no stars off the team pretty quickly. They're very toxic. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they're, they're, they're never going to be one of the rock star, the superstars. You've got to identify those folks and unfortunately uh, move them off the team as soon as, uh, as soon as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, uh, some people don't fit nicely into one of those categories. So coming back to, to motivation here, we really want to embrace the reality that some people are content in their role and that's okay. It's not wrong for somebody to say, Hey, I I'm loving when I, I do, and I don't really want to get promoted right now. I don't really want more responsibility or a different role because I really like my contribution. I like the team that I'm on. I like the work that I get to do. We want to make sure to support that. I think it's important to know that promotions are not the only positive development for your team. Mm -hmm. And you can do some damage if you create a team environment where um, there's kind of this celebrity uh, status to people who get promoted, but other people who don't get promoted, there's no celebration or recognition there. And that's really where we want to dig in as strong leaders. We have to know how to decouple those things because recognizing somebody for their contribution to the team and promoting them are not the same thing. They can happen concurrently, but we need to create models where we still get to recognize and appreciate the people on our team who aren't always chasing the next accomplishment or achievement, but we want to recognize them for the important rock and stability that they are on our team. Yeah. So Josh, we have about two minutes left to wrap up and then I'll do the final piece. Here, uh, we'll come to our third pillar, tell the right stories. I said, you probably had a big question mark around this. Um, Really what I mean is we tell stories, uh, whether you realize it or not, to build and bolster our culture. We want to help our teams connect with what is a shared story that we have on our team. Uh, I think really simply put, and we can jump to the next slide, Tom, we want to tell stories to humanize our service offering. It's important to know that people are are actually much more motivated by the particular than they are by the generic or the general. And this is exactly how we help people shift from just liking their work to really being proud of what they do. And I'll share briefly for me, you know, I think the particular that I always think of, and it, it feels almost silly, but I think of how many how many kids are getting like birthday presents or holiday presents that are Mm -hmm. supported by the work that we do. The 55 Mm. people on our team supporting, you know, close to 200 different clients who employ, you know, 20, 30, 40 people on each team, the families that that impacts, the communities that that impacts, what we're doing, helping to steward the, financial resources and the futures of these companies is actually, for me, I like to think about how many birthday presents is that buying? And just think about this is having a a real tangible personal impact on Mm -hmm. thousands of people, which is, 
which is what helps me stay excited about what I'm doing when I look at my calendar and be like, oh, I, I have nine meetings today. All right, like let's buckle in, let's get a second cup of coffee. But to remember that this, this is playing out into hundreds and thousands of people's lives for their betterment and for the betterment of their families and their communities. And that's gonna be different for every firm and every company, but it's really important to circle around the story that helps your people connect with what's the why behind what we're doing and how do I stay locked into that um, as a part of our culture and to motivate us to keep moving forward together. Yeah. And, and so story to, shouldn't be just getting somebody rich. You know, that's not the story. That's yeah. not going to do it. You, you will not stay motivated to wake up and work every day. If your goal is making somebody else wealthy or famous. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, just to, to sum us up there, um, when our team members trust each other, they're specifically motivated and they connect deeply with our story. They're unstoppable. We're really grateful that you guys spent some time with us today. And now we'll open it up briefly, I think, to any questions we've got. Yeah, we have just one or two others. Um, so we have one that says, do you, what about meeting times? Because people are in different time zones. And so what I will say is we've chosen our time zone as Eastern time that we use. That's a majority of the people and it's where the company is based. We are trying to be cognizant of people's time. So our Monday morning meeting for all the team is at 10 o'clock. We know for people on Pacific time, that is seven o'clock. That's kind of early. Um, we also try to manage that with our clients. I have a lot of Pacific coast clients. For the most part, I don't take meetings after five o'clock. There are some occasions, but I get to choose if that's going to be the case. And so people can, that's how we manage that. Another one that's quick is, do we have a standard review form that we use? Because we talked about year-end reviews, and we do. Um, ours, I'll just give you an idea. There are several questions like, what am I most proud of this year? What were the challenges? How could the company better leverage my strengths? There's a couple more questions. And then we have very clear company values. And I rate myself on those values. And I walk through that with a group of people giving me feedback as I walk through and talk through that. So that's how we do that. Okay. A couple more things before we finish. People are here, I know you're here for CPE, but you also like to learn. We have a modern CPA success show. We have employees, we have clients, we have vendors on this show and talk about kind of all the different things we do and other things that we've learned. So we really encourage people to go to, I think we've got some great content for people on there. If you want to be interactive, we have the Slack community. So a CFO community, we have a number of CPAs, different firms that are on this sharing information. You can see some of the channels that are listed in here that we have you do get one month free access. So if you want to be more interactive and share ideas and get with some like-minded people and get some different opinions, this is a great way to do that. I mentioned that I do the CFO role full-time. We have a lot of people doing this. We've actually put together a course to teach people how to do the entire thing. So 15 different modules, it's a pretty intensive course. It does come with a free coaching session as you get finished. There's free materials and free software. You're part of that um, community that I mentioned. We also host a once per week fireside chat. So people will call in and say, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. I've tried to do the pricing module. It's not working for me. How do you do that? And we'll answer those questions live. So if the idea of being a virtual CFO is something you've thought you wanted your practice to go into, we've gotten some really good feedback on this course and teaching people everything that we do. If you say that all sounds great, I'm not a person who wants to start this all by myself. I'm not the entrepreneurial kind that Jody is. Come join us. We are looking for people we think we've got something really good going and we're continuing to grow. So please check us out and look for us to, to see if you just want to join and become a member of our team. So I'll thank Jody and Josh again. Thank you very much for sharing this insight. Um, it's fun to talk about things that we do and then also share kind of what we think has worked well. And I hope it's good for a lot of the people. And we saw quite a few people have some in the office, a lot out. So they, they should be dealing with kind of how to build this good culture. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everyone.